they went into the rest day yesterday and uh, they all travelled down to Italy, of course. Gazzelli just with nine seconds in hand over his fellow Italian Guidi and Rick Verbrugger, thanks to that good showing. And Dominguez also in the prologue doing well, those two holding down third and fourth places. But of course, all the mountains still to come. Right, well, we're going live now to show you just what's going on one uh, at the moment. I'm just hearing over my headphones that uh, on the road to uh, Piemonte, at this uh, stage of 150 kilometres, it was... Um Altogether, earlier on, up to around about 80 kilometres, in fact, when they went over the first of the three mountain climbs they've got to do today, the Coletto di Rossana, they were pretty well altogether there. Incidentally, the three climbs today include the uh, final run up to the finish. That is a mountaintop finish. They got to about 1,400 metres above sea level, which is, what, about 4,500 feet. So going up pretty high today. But um, the news is now that we have a, lead a breakaway group of some 13 riders, and you're looking at them now. There, uh, there we see uh, the lead group going through. I've only just received over my headphones the numbers, and the first number I noticed was number 121, which is Paolo Bettini, the Classics winner who, oops, was one rider just nipping out from somewhere uh, at the back of the peloton. So 13 riders now... What happened here? Oh, I see, that's what it was. The Kelby rider there, just uh, finding his way the wrong side of that protected uh, lamppost. Jolly good show that he... Oh, it's Escartine, my old favourite, Fernando Escartine. Of course, he's performed so well in the Tour de Spain and the Tour de France. He's been on the podium in the Tour de France in recent times, Escartine. But there's one of the leaders in that breakaway group. The rider you briefly saw there was Bileka, the Ukrainian who rides for the Langbau Credit team. Some interesting news uh, just at the start. Sad news, I'll have to tell you, about um, Team Telecom's Danilo Hondo, one of their top sprinters. Um, regrettably, he had a tragic death in the family on Wednesday. His mother sadly died. Uh, Danilo Hondo, not too surprisingly, has withdrawn from the race. As we see, a little shot of... Uh, the leader, Gazzelli, shaven head, almost looks like Pantani, except the colours are different now, of course, although Pantani's been in that Mario Rosa a time or two, former winner of the race, of course, but that is Gazzelli, the overall leader in the peloton at the moment. But um, sadly, Daniel Hondo was a non-starter today, whilst I'm just hearing that uh, the lead group is down to 55 seconds. They had 2 minutes and 15 seconds um, when they went away after the first climb of the day on 84 kilometres, but it's come down to a minute, and now it's down to 55 seconds so it might well be that they're beginning to pull this break back other retirers uh, today we've had one or two strangely there was a little crash early on but I heard that all the riders in it uh, back markers Zakharov, Duma, Munoz, Marichal, Van Dijk and Smirnov they all returned to the peloton but we've lost Daniel Clavero and Francesco Secchiari from the Mercatoni Uno team that's two gone from Mercatoni Unos that's not good news I'm not sure what's wrong with Clavero but I do know that Secchiaro, uh, Secchiari has a broken rib, so obviously that's not going to help his breathing at all, so he's out. And Landbau Credit have also lost one of their riders, uh, Domenico Romano. He has hurt his wrist, he's got a wrist injury, so he is out. And that takes the total number of retirements um, up to... 100, let's see now, 11 retirements, so 187 remaining. In fact, uh, more news coming over. We've lost Kurt van Lanke. He's been struggling um, in the early days of the race up in northern Europe with tendonitis, and uh, the lotto rider Kurt van Lanke decided, after a few kilometres today, around about 33, 34 kilometres, decided it was just too painful. So he sadly climbed off, and that means we're down to 186. We've lost 12 riders altogether, and we've not hit the high mountains just yet. Now, let me just tell you that today is something of a high mountain. Well, it's 4,500 feet up. It's a mountaintop finish. It's a very hard finish, and we won't be seeing the Cipollinis and the McEwans up there. Uh, we won't be seeing Daniel, Dan, Danilo Hondo, of course. As I said earlier, he has uh, gone home for the funeral of his mother. That's sad news indeed. Uh, but not a sprinter's day today. In fact, there you see Chippo in uh, one of his leader's jerseys, leading in the uh, points competition at the moment. And Cipollini, of course, not the greatest 
list of mountain climbers and we shan't see him figuring in fact uh, i'm very interested to um, just look at some of these numbers before i give them all to you uh, in this lead group because the first number i spotted was number one two one and i know that's paolo bettini who of course is in such great form uh, already this season bettini of course who won uh, liege baston liege for the second time just a few weeks back his third world cup victory in his career and uh, look at this caselli looking really strong on the front and uh, Casa Grande is in the green jersey there he's the king of the mountains although they've only been scrapping for very very small amounts of points so far and uh, Casa Grande's got much harder uh, mountains to climb to defend that pink jersey in fact a couple today nearer the end the mountain top finish itself and one around about 20k before the finish um, just to go uh, let you know uh, it's about 22 23 kilometers before the finish they go up uh, the Coletta del Moro the second of today's three climbs and that I promise you will sort them out because it's very very steep it's about an average of about nine percent which is roughly one in eleven as we're looking at uh, one of the Rabobank riders Engels the Dutchman who rides for the Rabobank team just pressing on out in front a little bit he's in this breakaway group uh, looking quite good of course they've got an interesting um, rider in the Rabobank team Matthew Heyman um, he performed extremely well in the very early season at Tour of Mallorca last year and he's in the team there Matthew Heyman if you spot a number 168 in the Rabobank colours uh, that is he the Australian who uh, gained a famous solo victory on the second day I think it was last year of the uh, Tour of um, Ma uh, Mallorca and then he went on to hang on to that jersey and uh, took, the, took the overall victory. February of last year, Matthew Heyman. Well, he's not in the break, uh, but his teammate Engels is. Some others I've already uh, established. Number eight is Saki from the Seiko team. Uh, 67 there is Torsten Schmidt from the Gerolsteiner team. We've got number 96, Piccoli, from the Lamprey Daikin team. Number 103, Benucci from Lambau Credit. In fact, uh, we've got no fewer than three riders from Lambau Credit. They really are doing well here. They've got Benucci, number 103. They've got Belike, the Ukrainian, number 108, who we saw in the picture a little while ago. And number 109, Metlushenko, another Ukrainian. So the Lambau Credit with three in this 13-man group although I'm not so sure judging by the pressure that's being put on behind by Garcelli and Casagrande this is fighting stuff I'm not sure that they're going to stay out very much longer um, we've got one kilometer to the top of this second big climb of the day and this really is a fearsome climb I tell you it's um it's only about 3.9 four kilometers which is what two and a half miles in english money um but there are some extremely extremely steep parts of it and engels here uh, trying to stay clear as bettini goes after him he's such a superb little peddler bettini isn't he look professional since 1997 on the right hand side of your screen it mentions those two victories in liege baston liege uh, but he's also had another uh, world cup victory apart from those two lieges he won uh, the championship of zurich last year and look how Bettini goes rattling past Engels. Oh, Paolo Bettini. Now, Bettini is quite a danger to uh, everybody here, you know. If he could hang on and uh, go clear up the final climb, although he's um, a little bit down on the general classification, everybody's expecting a big upset on the general classification uh, at the end of today, with it being the first mountain top finish, although not, not the highest of the mountains. And uh, Paolo Bettini is in such good form, they really really cannot give him too much leeway can they um, let me see some of these late other run i saw a couple of telecom jerseys and i've just managed to get their numbers 211 and 213 211 is grabsch and 213 is heikman so grabsch and heikman up there for team telecom both domestiques and uh, up there to uh, mark things for people like kai hundert mark jens hepner and Bettini on the higher part of this very, very steep climb. There's uh, quite a descent of something like three very fast kilometres after they get to the top. But from there on, the last 20 kilometres are almost all uphill. And this is either Grabsch or Heitmann trying to come up to the leaders. And he's doing a good job of it. Here's Paolo Bettini, smashing little climb, a small build. Look at the size of his frame. You can always tell if you look at the front end of the frame. Only a small head tube. 
And uh, meantime, and this is the back end of the peloton. We don't often see the back of the peloton, do we? And, uh, well, at the back end, of course, there's all sorts of problems for those who just are not the climbers. They're the domestiques. They're out there to help the team leaders. Some of them, of course, the sprinters, like the Cipollinis and the McEwens. Although, actually, Robbie McEwen's not too bad on the climbs. Um, he's a comparatively little fella compared with the six-foot-plus of, uh, of um, Cipollini, of course. He can climb him a little bit better than some of them, but uh, you would never put him in the ace climber category, would you? Meantime, this Team Coast rider here um, is really having a big problem. And uh, up at the front, you see the huge difference between those who know how to climb and those who sadly would love to but can't. That was Schweder, the German we were looking at back there from Team Coast. And he's going to struggle, certainly, not only up this one, but uh, up the last climb as well as Bettini just stands on the pedals and almost dances on them. One of my favourite little riders, this guy. But look at this, the telecom rider. I think it's Grabsch who's uh, grabshing a little bit of the attention, dare I say. I dare. He's coming up fast, the German, uh, to join him. And this will cause this little 13-man group to split up. I haven't actually given you all of them. As Lars Michelson is up there, by the way, for Team Coast, the Danish rider who joined Team Coast a year or two back. Lars Michelson, if you spot number 187 back there, uh, he's in this lead group. So too is uh, Gushu from Fonak. The, uh, Os the Swiss team, Gushu, has uh, managed to get up into that little group. Uh, so uh, he'll be struggling a little bit now, not the best of climbers. And uh, with Paolo Bettini now trying to put the pressure on. And look at this back here. We've got Simone. We look at Simone Casagrande, Garzelli all struggling up this climb you've got three of the finest riders in italian racing at the moment and it's a fellow italian bettini up front who's leading them a merry dance and even garzelli is struggling here to try and close the gap from the peloton up to this lead group out of which bettini has come and as you can see behind if you look very carefully just behind the telecom rider i'm pretty sure is grabs on this second of the three big climbs they do today there are one or two of the others of that 13-man group who've managed to get up there towards the front trying to hang on to the wheels of the stars there is tyler hamilton now tyler hamilton of course used to be with the u.s postal and uh, he's had a bit of a rough time since he transferred his affections to the csc tiskali team but i noticed just back there that was tyler hamilton in the red and white trailing in the footsteps of the big three from italy and it's not Grabsch, it's Heikman, it's number 213 Heikman, a 22-year-old from Team Telecom. He's only a young rider, Heikman, but he's doing a tremendous job as Bettini goes over the top ahead of Heikman up the uh, this terribly difficult climb, the Coletto del Moro. Well, that really has opened up the gaps, and they've now got a three-kilometre drop down, not exactly down into the valley, uh, but certainly a bit of a descent as they get ever closer to the last long, long climb. And it is a long climb up to the stage finish at the end of today's 150 kilometres, This the climb up Limone Piemonte, 14.2 kilometres long, it says on my note. And the average gradient is a mere, <laughs> a mere 4.4%, which doesn't sound all that... That, 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 that steep, does it, in uh, real terms? I mean, 5% is 1 in 20, so it's not even that. But it does have a steep part of around about 1 in 10, and the steeper part is actually higher up. So it gets worse as it goes on. You see one or two of the riders taking uh, a last opportunity to get a fresh bottle at the top of this climb, at the top of the Coletta del Moro. Incidentally, those of you who like to know where we are, by the way, we've come down to Italy proper now after the tour of the EU a little bit earlier. Well, it is in the EU as well, I know. Uh, but this is the Tour of Italy, and this is where, for the Italians, the race really starts. Uh, those of you who know anything about Italy, you know the, the long bit down into the Mediterranean that looks like a boot. Well, if you go to the top of it, um, and if you just imagine the top part of Italy, well, we are in the southwest corner of the northern part of Italy. We're not a million miles away from the Mediterranean. In fact, tomorrow's sixth stage, and David will be back to take you through tomorrow's sixth stage to Varesa. Varesa, um, Varesa is actually one of the Mediterranean seaside resorts. So they're going down there, Varesa, uh, to uh, the seaside tomorrow. Uh, it's a longer stage tomorrow, 181 kilometres. Meantime, they are up in these mountains 
uh, which are called the Alpi Maritima, the Maritime Alps. And uh, the, the hills here, actually, are an extension of the Apennines. That's the long, 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 long mountain chain that runs pretty well down the spine of Italy. But it actually continues northwards and then northwestwards towards, well, almost to the French border, really. You're not very far from the Dauphiné country. As we see more riders going over the top, now back to the leaders. And here we see the leaders going down the descent. This is a tricky little three-kilometre descent, very fast and furious, very technical. And then we get to the start of the final climb, which goes on and on up to the finish at Limoni Piemonte. Today's finish after 150k. Stay with us, we'll be back. And welcome back as uh, the riders are just about to go through the town, which lies at the bottom of this uh, little descent and that leading group of 13 has now just become seven thanks to the efforts of Paolo Bettini just about seven of them as we uh, look at the man himself and uh, oh now then that's very interesting uh, it's all changed on the descent because the uh, big three have managed to get up to uh, Bettini so a very fast descent by them uh, whilst we were in the commercial break didn't spot that uh, so that gap that the 13 riders who then became seven uh, has been closed and the big boys have made it so we've got a very very interesting group now as we approach the start of the final climb up to this stage finish so one of the shorter stages today on only uh, 150 kilometers that's less than 100 miles and one of the Kelmy boys I see has uh, managed to get up there I'm not quite sure who he is at the moment we'll uh, take a little look when we get uh, a closer look a bit of a chase going on behind much better day than we had a couple of days ago uh, I was uh, watching it two days ago and uh, terrible weather but now that we've got down to Italy the Mediterranean weather has been much better than Northern Europe, although, of course, in Britain we've had some pretty decent weather in recent times, the last day or two. I hear there are some storms around uh, to the west and uh, southwest side of the country. Garzelli, number 126, the shaven head. 32 seconds between chasers and then uh, that's the second group and then 45 seconds to what I think is still the peloton although that peloton I hear is a little bit fragmented as a result of that that big climb over the Coletta del Moro less than 20 kilometers to go when they got to the bottom of that descent that most of them have now safely negotiated that was about 130 131 kilometers the stage finishes 150 so that gives you an idea of just how much further that these riders have got to go to uh, today's stage finish we're about halfway between turin and uh, san remo on the uh, mediterranean coast of course where the great milan san remo itself uh, finishes Casa Grande in the green jersey, Garzelli in the pink jersey. These two of the big, big men. Casa Grande, who's still to win a major tour. Paolo Bettini, well, he's usually a one-day rider, but he's uh, done very, very well so far. And there's Heikman, the 22-year-old from Deutsche Telekom, and the Kelmy rider, who I've not, confess, I've not yet identified. It's all changed around because not all these are, of course, uh, the lead from the original lead group. It's obviously all changed. Ah, here we go. Well, that didn't stay on the screen too long, but you obviously saw for yourselves that we had Belli and Casagrande. Now, that's interesting that Francesco Casagrande has got Vladimir Belli to help him for Fasa Bartolo. And, of course, uh, last year's winner, Gilberto Simoni, who lost a bit of time on that first hilly-ish finish when Gazzelli took over the pink jersey of race leadership. And there is the man himself in the pink with uh, one of the Seiko riders, that could still uh, perhaps be Saki, I think it is, uh, who was in the original little lead group, Paolo Bettini on the far side there from our camera. And if these boys hit this final climb more or less intact, then you've got to fancy your chances, the chances of these big riders, the big names, Garzelli in particular looking very good, isn't he? I was quite impressed with uh, the way that the telecom rider Heikman came up so quickly. Uh, as I say, he's only 22 years of age, haven't seen too much of him before. 
but obviously uh, he's in pretty good form because he climbed that second climb quite well. And he's in very good company. It looks like uh, the CSC Tiscali rider there has been in a little bit of bother. That's Carlos Sastri. Ooh, look at that. I can almost feel it from here. Yes, um, I didn't, we didn't hear of all the numbers who'd been involved in that crash earlier in the day, but it looks like Sastri was one of them. I heard the names Zakirov, I wrote them down. Duma, Munoz, who performed miracles in the Tour of Lankawi a couple of months back. Marischal, Van Dijk and Smirnov. Obviously looks as though uh, Sastry was also involved in that. Oh, and that's... Uh, uh, oh, that's it. That's a playback of Sastry and what happened to him. So that was a separate crash as we just took a little look at that one. So that's what happened to him. It wasn't the original crash. He was in one or off his own. And whether he touched the wheel of the man in front or just miscalculated that corner, I don't know. But that's the result. A blooded left elbow. But uh, fortunately, you saw he was back on his bike. And look at this. The mappy rider, Bettini, is really riding for keeps. And as I said, if these guys hit this final climb together, we're going to see a right royal battle. So I shouldn't go too far, if I were you, from your television sets for the next half hour or so. Because this looks really, really exciting. Garzelli in the pink and Casa Grande, who's been so close and so near and so far to a major win. He's not had the best of luck. He's crashed out once or twice. had two crashes this season. I remember him crashing out of the Tour de France three or four years ago, 1998, I think it was, when he's been there or thereabouts. And I think we're going to have another look at that crash uh, by Carlos Sastri because it wasn't sh I wasn't quite sure what happened. Here we go in the corner. He's on the left, just by the Kelmy rider. Now, there's the Kelmy rider on his right. Here we go, round the corner. The Calvary Rider is going faster. Sastry seems to have it, so he didn't touch a wheel or anything. He's got it under control, gets out of the saddle, and I think we're just about coming to it now. Now, doesn't appear anything wrong there, and then suddenly, whoa, listen, now what caused that? What could have caused that? I, I just don't know. It was not the fault of Sastry. It did, the the Calvary Rider was too far in front of him for it to be a touch wheel, but nonetheless, down he went. And, well, these things happen. That's what bike racing's about. The race goes on, I'm afraid. And uh, he did pick himself up, as you saw. And we had a shot of him, didn't we? Safely back on the wheels of one or two other riders. As this lead group looks very, very strong indeed. Simone, number one. Out there in front, Casa Grande is there, Garzelli is there, Bettini is there. What a group! It, this is really terrific. Oh, welcome back as we get a shot of the Pirate, who's... Uh, not having the best of tours so far. Remember, he won this race, as indeed the Tour de France he won in 1998. But uh, he's not having the best of luck. He's lost a couple of his teammates, Pantani. Already today, sadly, uh, the Mechatonic Uno losing Clavero and Sacchiari. Sacchiari is uh, one of his great lieutenants in the uh, Mechatonic Uno squad. As we go back to Bettini and uh, the pink jersey of Garcelli. The pink jersey of Heikman, the Kelmy jersey of Perez, the Seiko rider, Simone. And a little lower down the slopes, we see the chasers. And I think we're going to have a look at Crass because I've just heard some rather startling news over my headphones. The CSC Tiscali rider there, here we see it again, in fact confused me because I saw his number and took it to be Sastry. But in fact, this is Tyler Hamilton you're watching who came off when uh, he was part of this uh, leading group at one stage and lost contact. And this is how it went. And this was Tyler Hamilton, the American former US postal rider. And the reason why I got it wrong was that uh, Carlos Sastry and there he is, Carlos Sastry stopped and gave him his bike. And I saw the frame number, one th um, which was Carlos Sastry's number, and uh, silly me, I took that as being the number of the rider. Uh, but Sastry had given his teammate the bike, and so that was Tyler Hamilton, who was up with the leaders at the time, but sadly now is not, as we get an aerial shot of one or two of the Kelmy riders, the only Spanish squad in this Italian race. Incidentally, a quick hello to a couple of juvenile f uh, Kelmy fans uh, from the Harrogate Nova in Yorkshire. Uh, Dan Hardesty and Matt Bishop, who are avid follows, followers of the Kelmy Costa Blanca, 
Eurosport team. And uh, Dan and Matt will be tuned in, I'm quite sure, or if they're not, if they're at school or whatever, I'm sure they'll be uh, videoing this and watching it later. Well, hello, Dan. Hello, Matt. Hope you're enjoying Kelmy's participation. At this moment, one of the riders, Perez from the Kelmy squad, is out in that lead group, rider number 88, so I'm sure that they will enjoy that. And uh, hello, say hello to all the rest of the Harrogate Nova boys. That's up in my neck of the woods. Well, the sun's shining on the race here today as uh, we come towards the end of the first week of racing. We've already had one rest day, of course, which wasn't much of a rest because the riders had to transfer a long, long way down from uh, the northern parts of Europe down into uh, Italy. And it didn't stop, by the way, it didn't stop um, Garzelli the leader of the race overall taking a little look at uh, the route because he was out there yesterday as soon as they arrived he got out on his bike and went to have a look at that Coletta del Moro that we've just been over, the big big climb that the riders have just been over, to have a look at it in preparation for today and obviously um, it's paid off because as you see he's now managed to get himself up into the lead group uh, let me just go through that group once again the reigning champion, the winner of last year's uh, Giro d'Italia, Simone for sake two of the Fasa Portolos, Belli and Casa Grande, the Kelmi rider Perez, two of the Mappies, Bettini and Garcelli, wow, what a duo that is, and Team Telecom's young Heikman, those are the leading seven riders, as the bunch here attempts to keep them within reasonable distance, but uh, they've got to do that very sharpish, because this road is beginning to uh, go uphill now, and as it goes more and more uphill, then I think we'll see the likes of Simone and Casa Grande and Bettini as well, and Garcelli forcing the pace, and this could be a real shakeout. Now, Garzelli, of course, is overall leader. He's got 31 seconds in hand on Casa Grande, who is in sixth place as of this morning. Um, Simone, meantime, is a little bit further behind. He's down in 23rd place, the 2001 winner, of course. Um, he's uh, at 52 seconds, so a little bit of ground to make up on Garzelli. At the moment, Garzelli is in a very, very good position. The mountain climb is the sort of climb he will like. It's not enormously steep, although it does go on for some distance, as I said. Uh, they're on the uphill climb now. They've probably done, as I speak, about 136 kilometres, something like that. Something like 13 or 14 kilometres maybe still to go. As our motorbike cameraman goes on along the outside of the main peloton and the Mappy boys, well, they're keeping a nice tin hat on things at the moment because they've got two boys up the road, Bettini and the race leader Garcelli, so they're really sitting pretty at the moment and uh, they won't need to do anything, just to keep a tight hat on it now as uh, Heikman for Team Telecom is in the picture there and uh, it looks to me as though they've actually come back to the main group, uh, those riders, so uh, there's a chance for everything to change a little bit higher up the climb now. In fact, just going through our picture there is Perez the Kelmy rider. So a bit of a regrouping then with 10 kilometres to go, so a little less to go than I thought, but it's all uphill. So the Mappy boys controlling things. And uh, that's Bettini there in second place, just behind his teammate Cioni. 10k to go, that's Cioni on the front, there's Bettini right there. And, uh, well, they have been caught by a sizeable group, so 30, 40, there must be 30 or 40 riders there in with a chance as the road ahead of them steepens towards the higher part of this climb to the top of Limone Piemonte. The actual name of the top of the climb is its actually called the Panice Soprano. It's a, sea, a ski resort. Uh, you won't be too surprised to hear that. Um, and uh, it has a name, Panice Soprano, on the top of the Limone Piemonte. You'll probably see some of the ski lifts as uh, we get up there. Now then, I wonder whether that bike is for a bike change for... Tyler Hamilton or Carlos Sastre. Remember, I was confused because I saw the frame number and it was Carlos Sastre's frame number, but it was Tyler Hamilton, let me just stress, who was involved in that crash. And I just can't for the life of me think what happened there. He seemed to be okay, and then suddenly, whoops, he was away. But there he is, and you see the frame number is the number of Carlos Sastre. So it could be that the CSC Tiskali boys are awaiting his presence and going to give him his own bike back again. 
There you see what's left of the... Uh, well, that's the lead group. The peloton is a little bit further back. That's the there, there's all the mappy boys. That's the lead group. Now, Tyler Hamilton is actually back with them. He's done a tremendous effort, and there he is on the far side in the red and white. Obviously, the injuries, although it looked, that left arm looks pretty bad, uh, he's clearly not in any enormous problem. And it looks like they may be planning to give him his own bike back again. He's riding with number 131, and it was that that I saw. Oh, and look at this. At the back, we've got Pantani, who is in a bit of trouble on the back. Conti for Akoi Saponi with him there. And Pantani, well, he's had his problems both on and off the bike. The authorities have been uh, hounding him, it has to be said. And he's been declaring his innocence of uh, all the accusations that are flying around about him and one or two of the other riders. And now you see the lead group went through the 10k to go some time ago. And yet Pantani, winner of this race, as the Tour de France as well in 1998, Pantani's only just gone through. So it looks to me as though it's not going to be Pantani's uh, year this time around. He's not done a lot so far this season. Uh, to the best of my memory, he hasn't had a victory so far this year. In fact, Pantani's not raced much this year, never mind, had a victory. Uh, I remember him riding the Criterium Internationale, but um, he didn't cover himself in glory in that race. And uh, uh, he sees the back of Tyler Hamilton there. And uh, that race number, you can just about read it, number 204, which is, of course, the number four Tyler Hamilton. Number 201 is Carlos Sastry. And he hasn't... I don't think he's uh, had that bike change, otherwise we'd see him chasing back to this group. And there you see the frame number, number 201, and yet he is number 204. So uh, the masseur will be anxious to have a look at him this evening to make sure that everything's OK and the muscles, he's not damaged any muscles. Meantime, on the front, still the Mappy boys, Cioni and Bettini doing a lot of work on the front. Bettini's been in great form, remember? He went over the top of that previous climb, the Coletta del Moro, in first place as... Uh, we look to the mountain area where the stage finishes today, Limone Piemonte. Beautiful countryside, these uh, Alps, the Marita Maritime Alps. And uh, in the depths of winter, of course, the snow up there lies thick on the ground. And it's a real playground for those who like to put the skis on and hurtle down the slopes. Uh, but right now, these are the riders in the Tour of Italy, trying their best to uh, go as fast as they can up the slope to that stage finish. Stage five of the 85th edition of the Giro d'Italia, which all the press seem to be calling the Euro Giro. Back to Paolo Bettini. He's doing an enormous amount of work on the front here. This is a three-week tour, Paolo. Long way to go yet, you know. Just a reminder of the overall standings of the leading riders uh, who you would expect to be there or thereabouts in another couple of weeks or so. Casa Grande at 31 seconds. Dario Frigo, I haven't mentioned him so far, uh, did well earlier this year. Uh, he's at 41 seconds in 10th place. Simone, former winner, last year's winner at 52 seconds and Pantani starting the day at 144 but you saw a little earlier that Pantani is losing ground here and uh, surely he's going to be uh, far far down the general classification sheet when it comes out later this evening at the end of this fifth stage of this year's Giro not a good day at the office for Marco Pantani and this group you know is really beavering away up this climb the pace is very good uh, i noticed when we got to the halfway stage uh, it came over my headphones that the race average was 42 kilometers an hour which is more than 26 miles an hour and here's that little group containing pantani gruppo pantani and there is the pirate himself not looking terribly happy he's got one of his teammates there i see uh, looking across that's for uh, no no it's not it's Mas Man masanti uh, number 135 uh, is just looking across to make sure he's all right so pantani in all kinds of bother as we go back up to the head of affairs and concentrate on Garzelli, who's got all his henchmen from the Mappy team around him there. Simone, uh, number one in the Seiko colours. Simone right there, the defending champion. 
rode gloriously well last year and uh, has made no secret of the fact that he would like to give Lance Armstrong a run for his money in the Tour de France and somebody's going to have to. Uh, the news, of course, is that Jan Urich, who's still having knee problems, uh, has decided that uh, he will not be fit in time for the Tour de France and so one of Armstrong's great rivals will not be there. I wonder whether Simone can do well here and in the Tour de France. Well, riders have done that in the past, of course. The great Eddie Merckx did it. Stephen Roach, of course, did it. And Marco Pantani, too, has won the, the Giro and the Tour de France in the same year. Oh, Simone looks quite cool, calm and collected. Nine days in the pink jersey. Two stage wins and altogether 11 victories as a professional. Mind you, that's a long way back from the victories of uh, Mario Cipollini, isn't it? I was uh, just uh, adding on his two victories in this race so far to his gains in previous years. And Mario Cipollini has now had 173 professional victories, a remarkable total indeed. In fact, there are only two riders, those of you like like this sort of statistic, um, there are only two riders, as far as I know anyway, currently in the pro ranks who have scored more than 100 victories. Uh, Cipo obviously won 173. And Laurent Jalabert, of course, is the other. Uh, his latest total is 161. Laurent Jalabert's had three so far this year to take him to that particular total. And nobody, unless uh, somebody can correct me on it, I, I was going through the records only a day or so ago, and uh, I couldn't find anybody else who had, uh, of the current riders, that is, who uh, have scored more than 100 professional victories. Now then, Paolo Bettini's done an enormous amount of work to set up the Mappy squad and uh, have a sort out of some of the other riders, like Pantani, for instance. They've sorted him out, haven't they? They've got rid of him. And it may well be that Paolo Bettini, his work for the day done, might just rest on his laurels now and take it easy up this last climb. As we now see Cioni doing an awful lot of the work on the front. Garzelli there in pink in third place. Simone right on his wheel and in green just behind him, Francesco Casagrande. You know, the Italians would really love it if Casagrande could come good because, OK, Simone's had his day. He won it last year. And uh, Garzelli there in pink, he's had his day too. But um, Casagrande, well, he's just missed out on so many occasions he's, he's very very consistent in fact so consistent is he that a year or two back he was actually ranked number one in the UCI world rankings which of course awards points for races I think most of you regular viewers here on Eurosport to the cycling know that um, different races have different points levels according to the importance of the race and uh, you accumulate points throughout the year and that gives you your UCI ranking the Union de Cyclisme International they calculate the points and regularly issue updated lists as to the current rankings of riders and Casagrande is one rider in the peloton who has at one time reached the number one position there's Dario Frigo now we've not seen too much of Frigo remember he was uh, uh, kicked out of the race last year and uh, he was promptly sacked five kilometres to go. He was sacked by Fasa Bortolo, the team he was with then, after a great start to the season when he won Paris-Nice last year. But now he's back and attempting to do well in this Tour of Italy. Now, this is one of the little Colombians who rides for the Formaggi Trentini team, not one of the best-known teams, La Verde. And Colombians, you know, they have a history of producing good little riders. Uh, and, well, this guy's just taken a flyer off the front of the bunch with 5K to go. Now, could this be a little bit of a surprise uh, two minutes ten seconds now for this lead group and uh, the main field or what's left of it I just heard by the way over my headphones that Daniel Nardello is back in that group of course he's the Italian champion at the moment you may recall he was in the champions jersey in the Tour de France last year had a horrendous crash and oh dear knocked uh, ten bells out of him for the time and I've just had confirmation that uh, what I thought had happened has indeed happened um, Paolo Bettini has come out of the back of this lead group, his work done uh, that's just been confirmed meantime we're now going to concentrate on this fella here up front La Verde, the little Colombian and climbing just like Colombians tend to do 
and uh, making a nice job of this, but he's still got a fair old way to go before he actually gets to the top. Don't know too much about this fella. I've not uh, come across him before, I must confess. Uh, but uh, if he's a little Colombian and he's in the Tour of Italy, he's got to be a good one because uh, they all tend to be when they get to the pro stage, don't they? Um, there were two of the uh, Colombians for the Columbus Cell Italia team who did exceptionally well in the uh, Tour of Lancaui a couple of months ago, Munoz and Marang. Uh, Marin won the race overall, eventually Munoz took the king of the mountains and what a tremendous performance those two Colombians did up the Genting Highlands climb which is the big, big mountain. I think David was talking about it just the other day, well uh, he's been out there on a number of occasions, I've just been out there the once and we're both singularly impressed with that climb I can tell you but it's a, it's a typical climb for the Colombians and now you're watching one of them coming up the climb and he's pedalling very well and he's forcing these riders really to uh, almost bust a gut to try and keep up with him and out of this group surely at some stage must come some kind of a counter attack as uh, Michael Pogat the former Dutch champion of the Rabobank colours just going through our picture his teammate on the back there was Engels the Dutchman for Rabobank and the way these climbers tackle these major climbs these days is an absolute phenomenon isn't it they are absolutely amazing Now he's built just like the typical Colombian climbers. He's not a huge danger on the overall classification so far, but if he were to hang on and take the stage, then obviously he would bump himself up a place or two. There are the usual um, bonuses at the finish, as there are indeed every day. So even if he... If he can win the stage by a few seconds, add on the stage bonus as well. That'll help him enormously. There's Engels trying to go after him. Casagrande in green there, really having to uh, dig a little bit deep. Is, is, he, is it my mistake or is he just puff, puffing a little bit there as the Mappy boys try to keep this... Colombian within striking distance on the higher slopes of this climb. It, just a reminder, I think I mentioned it earlier, this climb is not enormously steep in average, it's only 4.4%, but towards the top it does get up to 10%. Uh, did I spot one of the Calvi riders going there? Yes, I did. Another of the little mountain goats, and this time it's De Los Angeles, number 85 for Calvi Costa Blanca, who's also having a little dig. And this is where... The specialist climbers really begin to enjoy themselves and uh, just see how quickly he's managed to get up to the the Colombian he's gone straight past him oh well he's left him for dead and gone up the far side of the road De Los Angeles just flying past La Verde that's incredible the difference in speed there suddenly La Verde I don't think knew what hit him look at this here it is again up to him and on the right-hand bend, cuts right across him, and poof, he's got the gap just like that. And three kilometres to go to the top of this climb. So now we go from a Colombian to a Spaniard, and uh, the picture's all changed. No, <laughs> just as quickly he's come back again. <laughs> well, this is, you know, this is to the credit of these big boys. They they keep a very, very cool head. Uh, it would be very easy to think that, first of all, Laverde was on his way to a stage victory, and then equally you could have been expected to say, well, yes, Dolas Angeles. And now we see somebody else having a go, and this is Zaletti. Now, this is a little bit more serious, because this fella is uh, a very experienced rider from Team Alessio, and... Uh, He's the sort of rider who could possibly stay away. Although, La Verde and Los Angeles, they've had their moments and they failed. 
Why should Zanetti do any better? Well, he's a f slightly more experienced rider than the other two. Done this sort of thing before. And Zanetti nearly got the bit between his teeth. Well, he's usually a workhorse in the team, but uh, he has had his moments of freedom. Uh, just a couple of, of professional victories to his name. Meantime, I'm hearing that Dario Frigo has blown a gasket. Well, that's interesting because Frigo showed very good form just recently. But I'm hearing that he's in trouble. Frigo in big trouble, I'm told, and he's dropped off the back of the pack. Oh, he was with this lead group, of course, but uh, not anymore, he's not. Won the Tour of Romani just a couple of weeks back and um, did very well in Paris-Nice. He won the mountain top finish, stage six of Paris-Nice. But uh, Frigo is being sorted out, as is Il Parata, the pirate. Marco Pantani. So this race really boiling up. Uh, we haven't even been racing for a full week yet. The pace in the lead group now being taken up by Cadell Evans. He's a remarkable rider, that Australian. He's a former mountain biker, of course. But Cadell Evans has already gained... And there's Frigo in uh, big trouble at the back as we go back to Zanetti at the front. Uh, Cadell Evans is a, a man who has converted to uh, this sport with great success. Already two King of the Mountains jerseys have uh, become his so far this season. As we've got yet another rider, this time the Lamprey man, Garatti, having a go. Everybody having a go. Oh, and Casa Grande doesn't like that. So look at this. Here we go. The red kite is reached with Zanetti still out in front. Now, this would be only his third professional victory. Now, where is Garatti, the chaser behind him from Lamprey Daikin? Can the Lamprey rider catch up to him? Or are they all going to bubble and squeak up to the finish and catch the pair of them. Here is Zanetti. There is the chaser, Garatti. They're inside the last kilometre. Here's the rest of the lead group containing all the big names. There's been a bit of a sort out. One or two big names are in trouble off the back, as we've heard. Dario Frigo's blown a gasket. And uh, Pantani, too, has lost a lot of time. Now then, Garatti's coming up fast here on Zanetti. Here we've got the two riders in the lead on stage five. They've been riding for three and three quarter hours now. And I don't know whether Zanetti can hang on here. He's looked back there. He He's seen the chase. Here's Garatti, the Lamprey Daikin rider. Number 94, can he get up there? It's a Spaniard, by the way, Garatti. Although he rides for an Italian team, he's a Spaniard by nationality. And he's almost up to him. Now, this is going to be quite exciting. And we've got another chaser there now. Is that, is that Simone? I'm just wondering who, I could have sworn I saw a brief glimpse of a Seiko jersey there, just a few yards further down the hill. And if that's Simone, this would be a sense sensational finish to this stage and everybody out of the saddle now they're inside the final kilometer Zanetti seeking only his third professional victory since he turned pro in 1997 and the sprint is on behind them to try and catch them uh, they may well get up to him in fact they've already gone past Garatti Zanetti's there to be shot at and the Kelby rider it could be Perez who's up there not quite sure yeah, or it could be Los Angeles and they're all going to get him it's not going to be Zanetti's day it could well be Garzelli's day. Garzelli's already had one stage victory. Casagrande right on his wheel as they're inside the last few hundred metres now. Can Casagrande hang on for the stage win that he so richly needs? But now he's got Garzelli to contend with. Casagrande in green going on the left-hand side of our picture. But Garzelli not to be outdone. This is going to be so, so close as they come round the final corners. Garzelli desperately 
watching this one. Garzelli in a big gear now, and Garzelli is really looking strong. It's one of the Kelby riders on his own, and Casagrande is not going to make it. It's Garzelli on the line in the pink. He extends his lead in the Giro d'Italia with a very, very strong finish at the end of a hard, hard climb up to the top of Limon in Piemonte. Stefano Garzelli, the winner of the race a couple of years ago when Marco Pantani, to his credit, did an awful lot of work in the closing week to help his then teammate. And now, of course, they're in opposing teams, but Garzelli really has thrown the gauntlet down to everybody here. I think it might have been uh, De Los Angeles who got second place there for the Kelmy team. It was indeed De Los Angeles in second place, just behind Garzelli. But that will only serve to increase Garzelli's lead. Still early days, I know, in the Giro d'Italia. We've got plenty of big mountain finishes to come yet. And Garzelli has got a lot of hard work to do. But he's shown today just how strong he is, particularly this. He'll be delighted with that, showing how strong he is at a mountain top finish as we go back down the slopes and see the unfortunate Marco Pantani with his teammate, Massani for company, helping him up the mountain. This is not the Marco Pantani of 1998. His troubles, I think, off the bike have to be affecting him on the bike. There's no question of it. You can't ride if your mind is not settled and you've got things bugging you and he's got all kinds of problems with the Italian judiciary chasing after him and other Italians as a result of the raids that have been held um, on the Tour of Italy both last year and in previous times. And uh, Marco Pantani has uh, repeatedly protested his innocence, but uh, the authorities won't let it go. And consequently, it's a very, very unsettling effect on the professional cyclist. And Pantani, he may well have the legs, but how could he possibly concentrate on the job in hand with all that going on around him? I don't know. Well, here we see another of the chase groups coming up to the top of the climb. It's been a long, hard climb here from the bottom of the valley. 20k, nearly 20k of straight climbing getting steeper and steeper to the finish and you saw just how steep it was up at the top end a roughly one in ten very steep graded towards the top end of the climb but Garzelli well really magnificent that he managed to hold off all those big names there as we see riders losing two and a half minutes here and dropping down the general classification and some of the uh, the sprinters the market uh, the, uh, the the Cipollinis will be coming up, so that looked uh, like uh, the Italian champion coming up. He was dropped a little earlier on. And look how steep this is. It really is a tough climb, this one. Glorious sunshine, though. The temperature's down in the valley in the mid-20s, but up here at this height, reportedly at just about 16, which is still 61 Fahrenheit, which is uh, not too bad, a very pleasant day all told, really, uh, for this finish. And there you see Branca Novara, uh, the, one of the main sponsors of this uh, race this year, put a lot of money into this race with its more than 600,000... Uh, sorry, uh, 470,000 uh, euros as prize money as we go back to a slow-mo of Garcelli's victory from De Los Angeles. And there, a punch in the air for the winner of stage five of the Giro d'Italia, Mappes, former winner of the race, Stefano Garzelli. Well... Still riders finishing, and there'll be a lot of riders losing a lot of time. I haven't spotted uh, Mario Cipollini coming up the climb yet. There's one of his teammates, though, in those zebra stripes, Roberto Conti, on the back of this little group, with uh, the uh, Pantani group. And Pantani's going to be losing around about four minutes-ish today. He started surprisingly in arrears at the beginning of play. And he's lost a lot more today. In fact, it's more than I thought. Gosh, it's going to be five minutes by the time he crosses the line. He started the day at 1.44. 
this is going to add another five minutes and more to that 144. So not good news for Marco Pantani. <laughs> Excuse me, five minutes gone and counting. And he's still not quite there. Well, one wonders whether Marco Pantani will carry on in this race after such a poor showing. On oh, one of the shorter stages, a mere 150 kilometers, not a, a long stage by any stretch of the imagination by Grand Tour standards. And yet he's losing well over five minutes. Meantime, already on the podium, the winner of the stage, Gazzelli, acknowledging the crowd, resplendent in his multicolored Mappy kit. His second stage victory so far this year. The celebrations in the Mappy camp will be uh, quite extensive, I should imagine, because this, for me anyway, has shown just what good form Garcelli is in. It's his third Giro stage altogether, two this year, but of course he won one back in uh, 2000, his victory year. But he's a long, long, long way behind the Mario Cipollini, isn't he? 36 all told now for Mario, closing in on the 41 of the great Alfredo Binder. Although, uh, as uh, Cipo himself has said, uh, it has to be borne in mind that uh, Alfredo Binder also won this big race on no fewer than five occasions, one of only three riders so to do, incidentally. Uh, just for the record, the other two, Fausto Coppi, of course, and Eddie Max. So, there's the uh, stage result, and it was Simone, I thought it was, in third place, just ahead of Casa Grande, and then a little break there, you notice, uh, and the rest of the riders in that league group timed in at seven seconds. So, seven minutes. Oh, I can't believe he's lost seven minutes. That is a very, very disastrous day for the Pirate. He will not be a happy bunny. And there's a marvellous aerial view of this ski resort here at the top of the stage finish here at Limona Piemonte. And I just wondered whether they were going to give us a rundown of the general classification because I think you'll see that Garcelle is... Uh, lead has extended considerably over Fabrizio Guidi. I didn't see Guidi in that lead group at all, actually. The team coast rider who started off the day at nine seconds. Nor Rick Verbrugger, of course. You wouldn't expect to see Rick, all due respect to him. And lower down the places. Well, Tyler Hamilton, he had his moments there, didn't he, in that crash? Still managed to salvage uh, a reasonable place in the end, but he had to work very hard to stay there after that rather strange crash. And here comes yet another pink jersey for Stefano Garcelli. Shades of 2000, although he's beaten one a little record of 2000 when he won the race overall. He only won one stage that year, as I mentioned just a minute or two ago. This year, he has already won two. So it's looking good. And Garzelli, incidentally, he may well, because, of course, that was a mountaintop finish. He may well also, I think almost certainly, he will take over as the leader in the King of the Mountains competition too. I've had no news of the Inter-Giro. That will come a little bit later. Stratzer, of course, was uh, leading that competition. He won it last year, Stratzer, incidentally. Uh, he also won the points competition, too. Um, but uh, whether he's uh, still the leader in that particular part of the competition of this race, I do not yet know. David will fill you in with that one, I'm sure, sometime tomorrow as we take another little look at the sprint of uh, Garzelli from De Los Angeles. Casa Grande just failing to hang on. Uh, I think he got fourth place in the end. Uh, but Simone came through so strong in the red jersey there uh, on the tail of De Los Angeles, who's had a little bit of a dig earlier on and didn't leave quite enough for the finishing sprint. There's Garzelli punching the air. De Los Angeles in second place. Uh, and on the line, it was uh, the defending Giro d'Italia champion, Simone, just holding on to third place ahead of Francesco Casa Grande. So three of the big names there in the top four. No disrespect to Los Angeles, who rode very well, as you would expect a Kelmy Mountain climber so to do. But Garzelli, really, really impressive for my money. And, uh, well, this race has still got over two weeks to go yet, of course. 
uh, but you've got to say that this man is looking very, very good for a possible second victory. Here we are, middle of May, still a little bit of the snow left on the ground. And, of course, this is not one of the highest of the mountains, of course. Uh, as I said earlier, the mountain top finish here is 1,400 metres, which is around about 4,500 feet. And, of course, the Pyrenees, the, uh, sorry, the, the Alps, the Italian Alps, much higher than that. But there you are, he's increased his lead now over Casa Grande, is in second place. 43 seconds, Simone at one minute. So you've got big boys at the front as this Giro d'Italia comes to its rightful home in Italy itself. And it's Stefano Gazzelli, the hero of the moment. Gazzelli punching the air then after uh, his second stage win. Well, David will be back uh, tomorrow for stage six. Let me just remind you, we go down from Cuneo to Varasa on the Mediterranean. We're live at, that's, that's Central European time, by the way, 3.15, so it's 2.15 on British Eurosport. It's 191 kilometres. It includes the climb of the Brick Breton, which features in Milan San Remo. So, follow David on the Tour of Italy tomorrow. Meantime, from me, Mike Smith, goodbye.